So much of our experience is unconscious. The past informing the way we perceive, express, relate and create. Our task is to illuminate all the ways the past has decontextualized into the present, set a compassionate boundary and discover a new way forward. Peace and power is the goal. Welcome to Decontextualized. I'm Natalie Rachel. Today's episode is TEDx Trauma and Truth. I'll be flying solo today for the last episode of the season to share my beliefs on humanity in the context of trauma and healing. But before we begin, let's take a moment to settle into our intention for our time together, to listen, to respond, to explore beyond what we think we know. Take a nice breath in. And as you exhale, let go of bias, let go of judgment, let go of agenda or any fixed outcome. Welcome your curious mind and your receptive heart. And from here, let's explore. If you're tuning into this episode, it's likely that you've been following my work, which has largely been centered around trauma and what it means to be trauma-informed and not only heal ourselves, but show up as the kind of human that promotes healing through relational dynamic. To me, the conversation around trauma is essential as a doorway to understanding humanity at this time, where we've come from, what's created us, and more importantly, the human intelligence we need to unlock in order to create a far kinder and more beautiful world. So that's what we're going to be exploring in today's final episode of Season 1, Decontextualized. Last year in December, I was really excited when I received an email from TEDx Purdue U and they invited me to pitch my big idea. And, you know, I've been working on this topic in, in the field of, of trauma and culture transformation for seven years now. And actually, I've been inquiring about it since I was age seven. So I used to sit and write poetry to try and make sense of what back then for me was a really scary, ghastly world. So I've been asking these questions. Why am I like this? How did we get here? Why are people behaving this way? I don't understand. And so in December, when I got that email, I felt um, so excited. Oh, finally, the world is ready to hear my big idea because to, to be a TEDx speaker is one of those really big things that I've aspired to for so long. So I spent quite a lot of time putting my pitch together and in the process, it felt like all of the words and concepts that I've been working with for so long and also, to be honest, adapting in order to make it safe for people to tune in and listen at a particular layer or depth. It was as if through that process that my concept purified and clarified and actually it was an incredibly emotional and beautiful thing. Unfortunately, I was not selected to be on the main stage of TEDx. And when I received that news, I had really bittersweet feelings. Of course, I was a little bit disappointed not to be able to share my big idea. Um, and over the years working in this space, I've had so many doors closed in my face. So it's kind of a bit of a harking back. Uh, however, I think, you know, everything's all as it's meant to be because those days that I would have had to fly to the US to go and speak, I actually ended up back in Australia um, to visit my very, very unwell mother who has Alzheimer's and no longer knows who I am and, and, you know, can't really respond. And it was a deeply difficult um, time to go back there, but so essential and Together, we engaged in a process where I felt this huge existential shift and letting go and honouring and forgiveness of our very difficult dynamic. And it reminded me that 
we always need to come back to ourselves and to our healing work. And it was such a moment of embodiment that I knew that that was far more important at that moment than to be standing on a TEDx stage. So I'm still actually integrating that experience even as I speak now. But the last few months I have been interviewing and speaking with these most beautiful guests for this podcast series and I was considering what should the final episode be about and I realized well just because TEDx didn't invite me to speak on this topic and share my big idea it doesn't mean that I can't share it so as always I want to be very empowered with what I create so my choice for this final episode is to share my big idea with you. I'm going to share the essence of my understanding of how trauma underpins much of humanity's issues. As humanity continues to move through cycles of distress, disease, mental health crisis, inequity, violence and oppression, we need to look at root cause in order to heal. Trauma underpins much of our modern day experience in the world. It's a very human issue that touches us all, either directly or indirectly. So if we are relating, which all of us are, trauma is part of our experience. Because trauma has its own language and code, we need to first learn to spot it, to decode it, respond to it and metabolize it. When we do our own healing work, we become the humans that break the cycle and learn how to live and relate in ways that support others to heal too. Much of our trauma has traveled and decontextualized through relationship dynamics, communities and cultures. And just as the trauma is spreading through relationships, healing can do the same. Relational intelligence is the root to a collective culture shift. And this is where my little catchphrase or slogan, heal your trauma, change the world comes from. Now, when TEDx approached me, they asked me to pitch my idea in the context of the terrarium theme. And I just think it's so apt. So imagine if the world is a terrarium, we have sowed our seeds in the soil of trauma. When plants fail to thrive or get sick, we can't just tell them to get well. You can't just give them a command. We've got to rake the soil, discard the muck, water them and feed them nutrients. Slowly over time, the plants will regenerate and bloom. They'll also produce new healthy seeds. Humanity is much the same. If we remove ourselves from the soil of threat, exclusion, harm and oppression, which are the fundamental experience or markers of trauma, and replant ourselves in the soil of safety, belonging and authenticity, which are the fundamental foundation of all healing, we will surely create a different experience for ourselves and each other. And if each of us is an individual terrarium and we create a greater garden or a bigger terrarium together, we can make collective change by A, healing ourselves and B, learning how to create a thriving ecosystem through relational intelligence. The issue that we need to explore is that we are living in a really traumatized world and healing's not happening. We are actually so hungry for healing, but our task is to create the conditions and dynamics that make healing possible. Unfortunately, many of our very well-meaning attempts to change the global landscape, to promote more belonging, inclusivity, well-being, peace and sustainability are not translating. In fact, they often breed more distress, hypervigilance, burnout, and unsustainable high-low cycles. While many of us have best intentions, we need to dig much deeper into the roots of our issues, stop looking for quick solutions or unicorns and commit to an entire overhaul of the way we are living, relating and creating. And before we can do this, we actually have to come back to inquiry. Some of the questions we need to explore include, why is our world like this? Why are we feeling this way, this level of distress and disconnect? 
Why are we not creating sustainable change? What's blocking us? And what is the root cause? The root cause is trauma. Trauma lies at the root of so much of our distress and dysfunction. Trauma is when a past experience of threat is living and breathing in us now. It affects us mentally, emotionally, physically, and relationally. It alters the way we perceive, express, and relate. It is largely physiological, unconscious, nonverbal, somatic, and felt in nature. It travels through relationships, families, communities, cultures, and systems. Our unconscious, unresolved trauma becomes the breeding ground for bias, threat, disrespect, violence, abuse, addiction, mental and physical health conditions, and the inability to live and love well. Trauma is not a past event itself. So we tend to consider trauma as this really difficult, big thing that's happened to somebody or us in the past. But trauma is actually how past experiences of threat, exclusion and harm are left unmetabolized inside us and go on to alter our experience and our expression in the world. So the way we metabolize or do not metabolize our trauma will depend on our resources at the time of and shortly after the trauma. So what may manifest as quite a big trauma for one person may manifest as a very small trauma or not trauma at all for another person. The extent to which we're traumatized depends on our internal capacity and our external resources. Interestingly, there's science that shows our relationships are the biggest predictor of our ability to heal, transform and grow through and beyond traumatic experiences. So if we've gone through something pretty difficult and intense, if we have had great relationships at the time of that experience or right afterward, people who can hold space for us, can meet us, can listen to us and let us know that we are safe and we are not alone, likely those experiences will not go on to become trauma. They will simply be difficult things, difficult periods that we have moved through. If we do not have those relational resources and we are alone with it and those experiences are left unprocessed and not shared, it is more likely that they will go on to become trauma. Now, I believe that humanity has experienced a collective existential shift and that this is our intergenerational trauma at play. So for those of you that have read my book, you will understand my entire concept for the book is the idea or the philosophy that in order for us to experience that all is well in our personal world and our collective world, there are three key ingredients that we need not only earlier in life, but ongoing. And those are one, safety, two, belonging, and three, authentic expression. So these ingredients, which are all actually offered or experienced dynamically through relationship, they set us up to thrive and develop this baseline uh, that allows us to show up from an origin of peace, curiosity, and love. Unfortunately, many of us did not get these foundation experiences over the last few generations. Instead, we've developed through experiences of threat, exclusion, loneliness, and loss of self. And so when these are at our core, they go on to feed our fear, our bias, our judgment, our mental health and our relational health. So we are born and we are created from this baseline of incredible threat, exclusion and aloneness. And therefore, we become an unconscious rolling reaction to threat, cycling through generations of distress, disrespect and chaos. The world that we have created is a deeply traumatized one. It's intergenerational, it's complex, it's multidimensional, and it's time for us to break the cycle and heal. 
for ourselves, our babies and our grandbabies. In fact, it's my spiritual belief that this is the task of our generation. We are a transformative generation. So when we commit to our healing work, it's almost like we're connecting back through the lines of our lineage uh, and offering healing to our ancestors. And we're, we're kind of setting this big, firm boundary that says, no, I will not allow this continued rolling decontextualization of intergenerational trauma to inform who I am anymore or what I'm creating or the relationships that I'm developing or the children that I'm raising. And to me, this is the work. However, we tend not to want to look at it. We tend not to want to talk about trauma because it's so confronting. But something I've been seeing with my work in the last couple of years, it's, it's as if these last few years through the pandemic and another, um, a number of other global crises that are still in motion, I think many of us are really seeing, oh, it's, it's time. We have to start talking about trauma. We have to do something differently. We have to set that boundary and break the cycle. Many of us are trying to create change all of the time. We're really intentionally wanting to create healing for ourselves and to change the way that the world is functioning, except most of these attempts don't actually integrate. And in fact, they take us further in the other direction. And I call this the trauma paradox. Underneath all of our distress and dysfunction, we're trying to heal in every moment. But while our attempts to heal remain unconscious and while our trauma remains misunderstood, we tend to recreate dysfunctional cycles again and again. And there are three clear ways that I see this show up. So firstly, our unconscious attempts to seek safety and belonging drive us further away from it. Secondly, our well-meaning attempts don't speak to or soothe our unconscious. We tend to like to paper over our pain or force ourselves, coach ourselves to be different, to be better. And in the end, we resuppress the pain and the shame of exclusion and of not being good enough. But it still lies beneath the surface and it continues to cause havoc. And so we've really created a world where we're just constantly shaming ourselves and constantly pushing ourselves to be somewhere that we're not. And the third way that I see this show up is that we continue to seek soothing through unhealthy, addictive behaviours and we leak our trauma into our relationships, our communities and our cultures through disrespect, oppression or violence. So our trauma begets trauma. When our attempts to survive and heal are no longer unconscious, when we illuminate them and bring them to light, we can begin to take intentional trauma-informed steps towards healing, transformation and regeneration. And I'll speak a little bit more about this idea of the trauma paradox. So when we have unresolved trauma, what often happens is that our nervous system miscalibrates. So we experience danger as safe and normal, and we experience safety and peace and belonging as somewhat foreign and therefore threatening. So our wires are all crossed. And so this is quite a complicated piece for us to heal. And the first for us is to begin to get curious and question what does safety feel like and what does threat feel like and how can I start to challenge the way that I'm perceiving it because many of us have these crossed wires and it's those crossed wires that that sort of miscalibrated neurocircuitry inside us that is the thing that then takes us further away from what we are trying to create. So understanding and mastering the nervous system and our relational dynamic experience is really fundamental to us beginning to heal. And that's why I bring a lot of work around the nervous system and the somatic, the felt sense into the work that I do. The solution for all of us to begin to heal our trauma and change the global landscape and reroute humanity towards everything we desire 
is trauma work. And trauma work asks us to look at these origins of trauma very deeply and really begin to consider how trauma and how this sense of threat and exclusion has shaped us. It also asks us to bring our efforts for transformation back to ourselves. So we like to orient outwards. We like to help everybody else and look at this big picture macro landscape when it comes to change. But the, the world we have created, the systems we've created, the cultures we have created, they are all an extension of our individual selves. So if we can bring that attention back to recalibrating and rewiring ourselves for peace, for safety, for belonging, for authenticity, what we will create will come from there. So I really believe that there is no bypass. And the third thing that trauma work asks us to do is to harness the power of relational intelligence or human intelligence for healing. And human intelligence is about understanding the unconscious, somatic, nonverbal, neurophysiological and dynamic nature of humans and learning how to relate in ways that heal rather than harm, in ways that invite those three ingredients of safety, belonging, and authenticity. And our ability to tap that level of relational intelligence is dependent on us reaching a certain place of internal stability and internal ground so that we have enough capacity to begin to use our internal resources to support others. This is how we heal trauma work. Each person who deeply commits to their own trauma work becomes more peaceful and powerful, more empathetic and compassionate. They're able to contain their triggers and reactions and relate with respect, kindness and healthy boundaries. They break the cycle and become not only an example, but a resource for others. So this is a pretty big concept. How do we begin? The remedy to all of our distress and all of our dysfunction is in the root. Underneath all our coping and survival mechanisms is the desire for those three core ingredients, safety, belonging, and authentic expression. So we have to learn to give them to ourselves and we have to learn to give them to each other. But you know, that sounds so simple. So if it was that simple, why haven't we figured it out? Why haven't we healed if it was that simple? This is because we are so attached to our survival and protective mechanisms. Humans are incredibly intelligent. We've got inbuilt survival mechanisms that help us prevail through difficult times, through trauma. Unfortunately, when we become stuck in survival mode, which is essentially the experience of trauma, these once helpful surviving and coping skills become the block to what we really need to heal, which is each other. Before we can heal, we have to build enough safety and capacity to surrender all of our survival and coping mechanisms. And this can feel really, really, really very overwhelming. Some of our most common survival and coping skills include orienting to success, outcome, and winning. And as I speak this, I wonder, is capitalism and the modern world of business and money and success really a trauma response? Gosh, that's a big thing to unpack, isn't it? Maybe I'll have to do another episode on that. Another one of our common survival or coping skills is doing everything excess, 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 overworking, overeating, over drinking, over medicating, over exercising. Every time we kind of get obsessed and go, 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 it's a sure sign that this is a coping mechanism. Something else we tend to do if we have unresolved trauma is we often engage in very dysfunctional relationships where there's a lot of chaos or abuse or neglect going on. And unconsciously, it feels safer to be in a relational mess 
than to be with and to process our own trauma, our own pain. And so with this one, part of healing is building up enough capacity to say no to the drug of dysfunctional chaotic relationship and come home to ourselves. And this can be one of the most challenging experiences because we then have to sit with this incredibly awful existential aloneness. And so many of us are running from this. It's a big part of trauma. In my book, I call this the wound of separation. And I give a little analogy that it's as if when we meet this wound inside ourselves, we're like a little naked baby on a median strip in the middle of bustling New York City and we're all alone and the world is terrifying and we're worried that we're not going to survive. And having processed this wound myself and having supported many through meeting this wound in themselves, um, it really is, I believe, the most painful, overwhelming and scary thing to sit with. But once we process it, we realise, oh, I'm actually safe in this world and I have the internal resources I need to be able to heal and survive and hunt and fish and be here. And I'm not waiting for this unnamed or unnamed person or this mirage dream fantasy experience to come and save me. I can do it myself. Another thing that we commonly use as a coping skill is bypassing. And so this comes up in the realms of meditation, positive psychology, and the rise of coaching. Now, I believe all of these amazing practices have a place, and I've engaged in all of them. However, when we orient only to tools that either calm us down or take us away from being with what's truly happening inside us and what needs processing we're bypassing and in my personal experience and in my experience working with so many people to heal their trauma at this very deep core root level there is a requirement to stop bypassing to stop running from and come to and be with and so when we let go of all of these coping mechanisms and survival strategies, we will then come home to ourselves and begin to feel all of the trauma and all of the pain and all of the things that we really need to process in order to repattern and recalibrate our experience at a root cause level. But because we are these intelligent humans that are primed actually for survival, we will not be able to do that, to sit with that until we have the resources available. And if we don't have the resources inside of ourselves, we need to create them in our external world. And so essentially this is through relationship. So when we are in supportive relationship, our capacity for aliveness increases. And so that's part of why this relational intelligence approach to healing is so important. Most of us do not have the capacity to heal our trauma on our own. We don't have enough resource. Therefore, we need to learn to collaborate and share it with so much intelligence. Let's talk about what happens when we do begin to enter a conscious healing process. So when we start deactivating all of these survival responses and coping mechanisms, we will actually experience initially a rise of threat inside us and will enter a stage called healing crisis. This often entails chaos, disruption or destruction of relationships, routines, systems and beliefs or organising principles that tell us how the world is and the way that we should experience. It can feel existentially threatening and without the proper support, we may revert back to our old survival tools. And a really clear example of this is addiction. So if we have been using addiction 
as a coping tool to avoid our trauma when we try to give up the drug. And, you know, the drug may be actual drugs, but it may be the overworking or it may be these unhealthy relationships. They're all different drugs. It may be our phones. It may be social media. If we give up our drug of choice and we come back to sit with the root trauma and the cause of all our pain, if we don't have the capacity to deal with it, we'll go back to using that coping mechanism. But when we do, and if we have the capacity to begin to heal at that very deep root level, what will happen is that we start to create changes. And so boundaries is a really, really big piece of this. So when we have enough capacity to start to heal, we'll start setting boundaries with ourselves and with other people and we'll start showing up in the world differently and all of the ways that we have been living and relating or creating will begin to crumble and this can feel really scary because there are consequences so for example if at work you set a boundary and say well I'm not going to work 60 hours a week I'm going to work 35 whatever that other 25 hours um was helping you to get done, you know, those things aren't going to get done anymore. And so when we heal, there's this destruction, there is a relational ripple effect. So something that happens is that when we choose our healing, often many of the people or collaborators or systems we've been relating with or moving within don't really appreciate our new boundaries and our commitment to our healing. But we have to honour that this healing crisis phase and this destructive phase is actually an essential stage of transformation. It feels awful, but our task is to hold ourselves and each other through this destruction process and beyond. It's raw, it's a vulnerable time, but it usually precedes recalibration, restruction, homeostasis and growth but when we're in it we usually can't see what's next so it can feel like there's this fog or this storm happening uh, and we feel very scared and so I think being able to talk about this phase as essential and to know what it is helps us to understand and therefore sit with it and navigate really slowly. So as that fog or the clouds clear, as the storm seems to settle, we can start to forge this new path, which is generally unknown. So when we're healing from trauma, essentially we're creating a new template for living, a new template for perceiving, a new template for relating or creating. And because there's not necessarily a map for us to follow and because it's often different to the ways that this modern world asks us to show up in, um, we have to go slowly one step at a time. And we're so used to rushing uh, and being very outcome oriented and goal focused and productive that that in itself can feel wrong or foreign. And part of healing is to notice that continued push towards going quickly and being generative and productive and again setting that boundary and saying actually no because that is one of the reasons that we've ended up in this mess in the first place because the world that we've created isn't sustainable look at what's happening to the earth look at the tech industry just crumbling right now look at banks going into closure what we have set up on every level can't sustain and so we need to begin to go so much slower one step at a time and this pertains to our own experience of living and it pertains to the communities cultures and systems and businesses that we create too so the result of all our healing work all this difficult stuff is that we become the social impact the world needs Trauma work takes time, commitment, and compassion. It is not easy. Not all of us are ready. But those of us who are, are going to go on to become the ones that create more capacity for healing in the world around us. We become the social impact the world needs. 
our internal systems become the blueprint for weaving a greater system. It all begins with our own healing work. We are the resource we've been looking for. Once we understand this and once we get to this stage where we are honouring our energy, our life force and our creative capabilities and capacity, then we step into relational intelligence. Relational intelligence is the remedy to everything that's going on in this world. We are dynamic. Just as trauma travels through relationships, so does healing. Relational intelligence is the one thing that can help us create systemic and sustainable change. And so something that I want to offer now are three lessons in relational intelligence that you can explore to get started on your journey of showing up as a human that heals. The first lesson is perception is power in purest form. When we commit to our own healing work and purify ourselves from threat and bias, we learn to perceive, express and relate with far more peace and power and we have greater empathy and compassion. So there's far less reactivity. There's a deep receptivity and responsiveness and this is where grace is born. And so when we begin to perceive and to move in the world from this origin and to kind of come back to it, because of course there are going to be moments where we get triggered and move away from this beautiful state of grace and receptivity and responsiveness when we do this we end up creating a new way of being here and embodying a new way of being here and we no longer move into the collective cycle of trauma and this brings me to the second lesson meet not merge so we are very uh, collective, dynamic and responsive or reactive. So we tend to just recreate these dynamic relational trauma cycles or spirals together. But once we have the capacity for receptivity and grace, we can learn to meet others' pain and trauma with compassionate boundaries that say, I see you, I hear you, and I'm present with you, but I do not join you. And this is how we break the cycle. On the other side of these compassionate boundaries, healing is inevitable and harm will no longer leak and spread through relationships. All healing and transformation work comes back to boundaries. The third lesson of relational intelligence that I'd like to share with you is commune with the unconscious. While we continue to speak to the rational mind only, healing isn't really possible because trauma lives buried in the unconscious. We can all learn to tune into the unconscious wounded parts of ourselves and each other that are simply craving space to be seen, heard and held. It's when those traumatised parts of us feel more acknowledged that they'll stop raging, hijacking and taking us further away from healing. This is how we begin to heal the trauma paradox. So I actually have 12 lessons of relational intelligence and they're the foundation of my one-year leadership program, Human Intelligence. Uh, but I just really wanted to offer you a few to start helping you to orient to, you know, to me, this is the medicine. This relational intelligence is what we need. And we can begin to explore it so that every interaction we have with each other or with our internal self is an intervention, is a bridge towards healing. The more relationally intelligent we become, the more powerful our social footprint becomes. This is how we show up in ways that heal rather than harm and lead each other towards a better world. Thank you for your time, your presence and your receptivity. The better we understand how we have decontextualized, the more we can begin to co-create a kinder and more intelligent world. If this episode stirred you, please like it, leave a comment or share it. 
to learn more about my work, visit nataliarachel.com or connect with me via LinkedIn, Instagram or YouTube. For now, leaving you with intentions for healing and collaborative, innovative regeneration.